Fujisaki mentions that they couldn't locate any cursed seal or mark on the body, which leads her to believe that the cursed user must be somewhere nearby. She reasons that if the user isn't a cursed spirit and is manipulating things from a distance, they should probably make a quick exit. Yuji then turns to Fushigoro, asking for his thoughts on whether they might be within the cursed user's range. Fushigoro responds by saying it's a possibility. He adds that the user's technique could be well-suited for stealth, or maybe the user is just extremely skilled at controlling cursed energy, which would make things much more complicated for them. Kuchisaki then shifts her focus to the woman, asking if Fukuzawa's face had returned to normal at any point during the ordeal. The woman replies that she doesn't think so, but admits it could have happened while she was asleep. Fushigoro takes this into consideration and says that, assuming the face didn't revert to normal, the cursed user's range must be at least 50 meters. However, to be on the safe side, he suggests they assume the range is closer to 100 meters. Yuji, now thinking ahead, asks how they should proceed, noting that they are currently in a crowded town with people all around. He points out that even if they were to search through all the buildings, there are far too many blind spots, making it difficult to track down the cursed user. He adds that they might be able to catch the moment the technique is reactivated if they find a good vantage point to observe from. Yuji suggests that maybe they could draw the culprit out into an open field, but Fushigoro quickly shuts down the idea, saying that it would only work if the cursed user was utterly clueless. Yuji, feeling a bit embarrassed, remarks that his suggestion now makes him feel like an idiot, to which Kujisaki playfully calls him a moron instead. She then teases him by suggesting that Yuji should handle the situation on his own since he can cover a hundred meters in no time. Fushiguro, however, points out that even if the technique stops working when the cursed user moves out of range, the user would have to be pretty foolish to reveal themselves immediately afterward, especially considering they've already made it clear they're not going to chase after the culprit. He suspects the user would simply lie low, wait for the situation to calm down, and then reactivate the technique without drawing attention to themselves. Upon hearing this, Yuji teases Kochizaki, asking her who the real moron is now, taking a light-hearted jab at both her and Fushigoro. Kochizaki, undeterred, jokes about sending the couple involved on an all-expenses-pay trip to get them out of harm's way. Fushigoro, though, points out that while the idea might sound plausible, the cursed user likely knows the woman's location through their technique, he adds that since the stalker is only keeping watch on them, it would be unwise to try and outstalk someone who's already observing them closely. Yuji then suggests that if they send the couple away, it could just give the cursed user more time to reactivate their technique when the couple returns. Fushigoro concedes that it's not impossible, but argues that doing so would only give the upper hand to the culprit. Growing a little frustrated, Yuji accuses Fushigoro of nitpicking, while Kujisaki agrees adding that Fushigoro seems to assume the cursed user is some kind of genius. She points out that there are plenty of less intelligent ones out there. Trying to lighten the mood, Yuji challenges Fushigoro to a game of Othello, boasting that he would win easily. Kuchizaki joins in, teasing that they would both show Fushigoro who's smarter. Unamused by their banter, Fushigoro dryly comments that their bravado sounds like they're overcompensating for something. He then steps outside, borrowing a pair of sandals, and proceeds to explain his plan. They'll have the couple leave the cursed user's range, and as soon as the technique reactivates, they'll make their move. Yuji follows him out, still grumbling that he and Kujisaki had suggested something similar earlier. Fushigoro calmly acknowledges this, explaining that his plan includes that very idea, while pointing toward a tall condo building in the distance. The building stands at least 40 floors high, easily towering over 150 meters. Fushigoro elaborates further, saying they'll have the couple visit a friend, then quickly relocate to the top floor of the building, which should be far enough to get them out of range of the cursed user's technique. A Gigi and a window will be in charge of monitoring the building's buzzer and entrance. Meanwhile, Fushigoro and the others will stay in a good lookout spot, waiting for the cursed technique to activate again. He also reminds them that they're dealing with someone who's obsessed enough to stalk Fukuzawa around the clock. Since they didn't find any hidden microphones or bugs, and as long as the cursed user doesn't have a technique to eavesdrop on their conversations, 
they should be able to outsmart the culprit. The couple waits inside the elevator as planned. The woman suddenly notices that Fukuzawa's face has returned to normal. Meanwhile, from the top of a nearby building, the trio carefully keeps watch over the situation. Kojizaki spots a man below and immediately asks who he is. Yuji, sensing a need for action, tells her to be ready. Without hesitation, she jumps down from the building. Yuji quickly follows her, and she finds the leap surprisingly easy to manage. They glance at each other briefly, but before they can react further, the man below begins to run, calling them idiots as he makes his escape. However, before he can get too far, Fushiguro's demon dog suddenly appears in front of him, blocking his path. Not long after, Fushiguro himself shows up, his demon dog pinning the man firmly beneath its paws. Fushigoro looks at Yuji and Kujisaki with frustration, scolding them for not taking the situation seriously. Both of them apologize for their lapse in judgment. Afterward, they bring the man to the woman, asking her if she recognizes him. She takes a good look but shakes her head, saying she has never seen him before in her life. The man, now angry, accuses her of lying and demands to know who gave her the bag she's holding. The woman pauses, thinking carefully, and it appears as though she is starting to remember something. As the situation becomes clearer, Kuchizaki remarks that the whole ordeal feels like a case of the pot calling the kettle black, since no one expected things to turn out this way. Fushiguro, however, finds the man's grudge petty, stating that it's unreasonable for him to expect her to remember every single customer from her hostess job. Kujizaki disagrees with him, pointing out that the man had spent a million yen, which isn't something most people would easily forget. Yuji can't help but laugh, adding that it sounds like a pretty good deal for what it's worth. He then turns his attention to the culprit, who is now sitting in the car. Yuji walks over to him and tells him not to look so down, reassuring him that it's not like they're going to execute him or anything extreme. The man, still upset, asks what they plan to do with him. He adds that despite being old enough to know better, he still tried to shift all the blame onto the woman. This conversation reminds Yuji of a talk he once had with Gojo. He mentions to the man that after training with Kusakabi, he plans to start training with Gojo next. In his memory, Gojo replies that it would be fine, but he hesitates, trying to find the right words to express his thoughts. After a brief pause, Gojo asks Yuji if he hasn't grown tired of being around him. Yuji looks confused, not understanding what Gojo is trying to say. Gojo then advises Yuji to think more about his future and to continue pursuing his dreams, even if something unexpected happens to him. He adds that if this is the point where he steps away, there will come a time when they'll surpass him. Gojo believes that at least one of them should move on, forget about him and grow in a way that leads them down a path different from his own. Yuji quickly responds, telling Gojo that no one could ever forget him. He also notes that Gojo seems a bit out of character, almost sounding timid. Concerned, Yuji asks if everything is alright. Gojo just laughs it off, calling Yuji a kid, and explains that what Yuji is hearing isn't timidity. It's a confidence that Gojo has never felt before. He ends their conversation by telling Yuji that he expects great things from him in the future. Back in the present, Yuji tries to lift the man's spirits, telling him that it's enough that he recognized his mistake and that's what really matters. He encourages the man to take some time to reflect on his actions and suggests that he could even join them on their next mission, stating that he expects great things from him as well. As they walk away from the scene, Kojizaki turns to Yuji and asks what he did with the cursed finger. Yuji casually responds that he tossed it away. Fushigoro, somewhat surprised, looks at him in disbelief. Yuji quickly reassures Fushigoro, explaining that the finger isn't dangerous anymore and will serve as a perfect talisman for the time being. Despite Yuji's reassurances, Fushigoro hesitates but eventually seems to accept Yuji's reasoning. Meanwhile, in another place, Mahito looks at Sukuna and asks him how he's doing, noting that no one expected to see him there. Sukuna responds by saying that this is their third conversation. Mahito explains that his technique affects the soul, and this meeting is nothing more than a remnant of that. He then welcomes Sukuna to the path where souls pass through on their journey in the cycle of life and death. 
Mahito mentions that he has a question for Sukuna. He accuses Sukuna of lying to himself and everyone else, not living up to his true stature. Mahito believes that Sukuna has been seeking revenge against those who hated and mistreated the cursed child he once was. Sukuna, however, replies that there's no real difference in how he's lived his life. He's always followed the only path he knew, and that's the one he chose. But he does admit that there were actually two paths he could have taken. Despite this, he couldn't control the curses boiling inside of him, and he feared they would eventually destroy him. Sukuna then wonders if, in another life, it might have been better for him to walk a different path. Mahito finds this line of thinking dull and boring, accusing Sukuna of going soft. As Sukuna walks away with Hiram by his side, he agrees, acknowledging that Mahito is right, he has lost his way. Mahito shouts after him, frustrated, as he feels like the only one left, sulking like a child who has been abandoned. Meanwhile, the living Jujutsu sorcerers, including the trio, continue on with their lives. Sukuna's finger is left in a secluded place, marking the end of this chapter in their story.